Good morning. Psychoepistemology 2, Lecture 1. You know that a basic tenet of objectivism is that the choice to think is volitional. You are free to think or to evade that effort. But suppose you make the choice to think. What is it that determines the nature and quality of your thinking? The degree of your intelligence? Well, I wouldn't want to deny the role of intelligence, but there's a far more important factor. The efficacy of your thinking depends crucially on your methodology, on what kind of questions you ask and in what order. Most people are not aware of the methods that they use. One reason for this is that their general methods are automatized. People apply methods of cognition without being aware that they are doing so, of what method they are using, or that there is any alternative method they could be using. Just as a person can have an implicit premise, an idea that he holds and relies on without knowing that he's doing that, so he can and does have implicit methods of thinking. Methods of thinking which he applies and uses without being aware of the fact that he is doing so or that there's any alternative. The simplest example of methods of thinking that people have implicitly would be that some people are concrete bound empiricists, others are rationalists who engage in floating abstractions, and some, too few, use a fully conceptual method of cognition. These automatized, habitual methods of cognition are what Ayn Rand called psychoepistemology. That term refers to the theory of epistemology that they actually operate by habitually in their psychologies, almost always unknowingly. Put it this way, some people habitually use the, their minds in the way that Plato thought they should. They engage in floating abstractions. Some people use their minds in the way David Hume thought they had to, the concrete bound empiricists. And some people use their minds in the way that Aristotle and Ayn Rand knew was the right way using inductively based, fully concretized abstractions. The science of psychoepistemology studied, studies these automatized methods of thinking from a certain aspect. I'll remind you of Ayn Rand's definition of psychoepistemology. Quote, this will be repeated later in a couple of pages, but it just is an introductory quote, so you don't have to copy it down at this point. Psychoepistemology is the study of man's cognitive processes from the aspect of the interaction of the conscious mind and the automatic functions of the subconscious. Close quote. Psychoepistemology as a science is a branch of psychology. It is contrasted with the other main branch of psychology, which is called motivation. Psychoepistemology studies the method of a man's cognitive processes. Motivation studies the content of those processes, what premises he holds. In my lectures on psychoepistemology at the Lyceum Conference two years ago, I discussed and explored the field of psychoepistemology from the standpoint of the basic principles of how the conscious mind interacts with the subconscious. Those lectures concern what might be called theoretical psychoepistemology. My lectures today and Thursday deal with psychoepistemology from a practical orientation. I call it applied psychoepistemology. So what do I mean by the distinction between theoretical and applied psychoepistemology? All the sciences can be classified as theoretical or applied. For example, biology and physics are theoretical sciences. Then the applied sciences 
use the principles discovered in the theoretical sciences for some practical purpose. For instance, building on biology, we have medicine, animal husbandry. Building on physics, we have the various branches of engineering. So what is the goal of applied psychoepistemology? In the most generalized sense, and this is just a first cut on answering that question, in the most generalized sense, the goal of applied psychoepistemology is how to use your conscious mind to make your subconscious function most efficiently and effectively. So clearly the motivation for being interested in applied psychopistemology could hardly be stronger. It tells you how to be an effective thinker. But in order to understand really what is applied psychopistemology, we have to review briefly more about what is psychoepistemology and how it differs from other fields. Now again, Ayn Rand's definition of psychoepistemology is the study of man's cognitive processes from the aspect of the interaction of the conscious mind and the automatic functions of the subconscious. Now let's concretize that by a really simple example of cognition a simple multiplication problem. What is 7 times 282? Anybody know? 7 times 282. Well, you shouldn't know. When you just ask yourself the answer, nothing or nothing valid is going to come to you, which means your subconscious doesn't have that information on file. You haven't memorized the answer. But now let's do the multiplication. I'll say the steps out loud as I do them. I want you to follow what is automatized and what is not. 7 times 2 is 14. Put down your 4, carry your 1. 7 times 8 is 56. Put down your 6, add the 1 is 7, carry your 5. 7 times 2 is 14 again, and 5 is 19. So there's the answer, 1974. That is a simple process of thought. I was able to get knowledge I didn't have before I went through the process. But notice that in carrying out the process, each individual step is answered by rote. You long ago uh, memorized the multiplication tables, 1 through 10, and you've memorized the steps of the uh, carrying and the addition that's needed. The answers to the individual steps of the process have been stored in your subconscious. When I say 7 times 2 is 14, just pops into your mind. Your subconscious feeds you that from automatized memory. You don't sit here and figure out what 7 times 2 is. You just hear the word 14 in your mind. Now that's as an adult. As a child, first learning simple arithmetic, you probably did figure it out, hopefully. You added, you realized that 7 times 2 is 7 plus 7, and you added 7 plus 7, and beneath that is the counting that you do to verify and understand an arithmetical relationship. But psycho, let's just say psychologically. Psychologically, as an adult, the, pro the process that I went through in its individual steps is the same as if I said, Mary had a little, and lamb pops into your head. Seven times two is 14 pops into your head. Then also, you don't have to think about the sequence of steps, the program for solving the problem, which means the sequence is at least semi-automatized in your subconscious. But the overall process of going from the beginning to the end is not automatized. It did not just pop into your head what the answer 1974 was, the way that 7 times 2 just pops into your head. You couldn't reach 1974 as the answer while thinking about something else or carrying on a conversation. To solve the overall problem, you have to initiate the program and to oversee its execution consciously. 
And because this is a process of thought, it is fallible. So you have to use your conscious mind to judge the result and decide whether it needs checking. So this is a very simple example of gaining knowledge by means of using your conscious mind to operate your subconscious. And the lesson of the multiplication example is this. Thinking proceeds by means of an ongoing interaction between the conscious mind and the automatic functions of the subconscious. Note I said ongoing interaction. Our cognitive use of the subconscious is not something occasional, but conscious. Calling on the subconscious is not incidental to thinking, not something that accompanies thought. The calling up of stored material and reliance on automatized connections among items is the nuts and bolts of thought. Now I'm skipping here observation, which is how information gets into your mind in the first place. We're talking about something where you don't have to perform an experiment, you don't have to go out and actually turn your eyes to look at something or hear something. You've done that earlier. I don't want to give the impression that thinking proceeds by introspection. But I'm talking about the point where the observation is finished or has been done in the past and now you are integrating. Now you are putting the pieces together. Thinking occurs by means of an ongoing interaction between the conscious and the subconscious. Without the stored material in the subconscious and the automatized connections among that material, you would be unable to speak. You wouldn't be able, therefore, to form sentences inside your head which means you wouldn't be able to think. In fact, you would be back at the level of infancy without the automatized stored material in your subconscious. But let's not slight the other half of the interaction, the conscious mind. By the same token, without your conscious mind's purposeful initiation and direction of your subconscious, you would be in a state of stuporous chaos. In fact, failing to use your conscious mind to take charge is precisely the state of being out of focus. Two years ago in my 1995 lectures, I said that the choice to focus, considered psychoepistemologically, choice to focus means the choice to use your conscious mind to supervise and manage the operations of your subconscious. To think, you have to have the interaction of the conscious and the subconscious with the conscious mind in control. You may know that Ayn Rand likened the, con the subconscious to a computer. This was way back in the late 50s, and there was only one computer then, the UNIVAC. So she called the subconscious your UNIVAC. In solving the multiplication problem, you used your subconscious as a computer. Nature has already equipped us with the ultimate in miniaturization, the brow top computer. <laughs> to, think, to think, you have to have both the computer and the computer operator, which is your conscious mind. Now let's take the computer analogy a little further, because not only will this clarify what is applied psychoepistemology, but one of the points that I believe in applied psychoepistemology is that analogies are very helpful. Analogies have to be used properly, but if they're used properly, they're one very good tool of accessing your subconscious store of information. Okay, if your subconscious is like a computer, it has a program. The programming of your subconscious is your psychoepistemology. It's the computer's program that allows you to use the hardware. It's the programming that enables you to get a computer, a real computer now, to write letters or work with a spreadsheet or play computer games. 
It's the programming that makes that possible. Your psychoepistemology performs the same task on your subconscious computer that Microsoft Word or Excel performs on your desktop computer. Your psychoepistemology is your automatized programs for storing and using your conscious conclusions. Let me be more specific. In the case of your physical desktop computer, how do you operate it? Well, you operate it by typing on the keyboard or clicking on the mouse. But it's the programming that makes those keystrokes and those mouse clicks do what they do on the screen, on the hard drive, and on the printer. Say you hit the 9 key. What effect will that have? Well, that entirely depends, doesn't it? If you're in Microsoft Word, uh, hitting the 9 key probably puts the 9 symbol on your screen at the current cursor location. But if you're playing a computer game, an action game, maybe hitting 9 will speed up the rate of the action. So the meaning of hitting a 9 key depends on the program you are running. In fact, you could write your own little program to assign any of a wide variety of meanings to hitting the 9 key. Now, your control is not infinite. You couldn't program your 9 key to vacuum your rug or decontrol the American economy. <laughs> you have to work within the limits of the capabilities of your hardware. But the 9 key's meaning on your computer is not fixed. Contrast that with the 9 key on your little pocket calculator. The result of hitting the 9 key on that is hardwired in. Hitting 9 on your little calculator does the same exact thing every time. It's not programmable. It doesn't use software. You perform the mental task of your life by means of your conscious mind now operating on your subconscious computer. And your psychoepistemology is what makes a given conscious instruction result in a given output on your brain or your muscles, just as it's the computer's programming that makes a given keystroke or mouse click result in a given output on your screen or printer. Again, never forget, of course, the basic objectivist principle that the operation of your conscious mind is directly volitional in contrast with the non-volitional automatic functions of your subconscious. And as I think you know, a person creates his own psychoepistemology. He writes his own personal programs for his brow top. He doesn't usually do this directly or deliberately. The creation of his programs, rather, results from establishing habits of thought by repetition. So the nature and quality of his automatized thinking methods is the long-term result of how he has chosen to use his conscious mind. For instance, consider the psychoepistemology of the second-hander. His automatized response to any question is, what do other people think? What do they believe? That is his program for answering questions. He asks himself, for example, whom should I vote for in this election? And because of the way his subconscious is programmed, what pops into his conscious mind is the opinions of his authority figures. This happens because he has, over the course of his life, consciously asked his subconscious time after time, moment after moment, day after day, feed me what others think. His subconscious gets the message. The programming is established by dint of constant repetition. And now what others think is automatically fed him as the frame of reference for every question. For example, who should I vote for? The second-hander's subconscious, to the extent he is a second-hander, is organized entirely around what others believe. It's, that's the principle of its organization. 
What they say and what emotional vibrations and cues they emit is the main structural program that organizes the material in his subconscious. Providing him with others' opinion is a way of responding that is now automatized, which I believe means it's now set into the structure of his neural wiring. Now, it's not unalterable. It can be changed gradually over months or years. It can be changed by a conscious effort of retraining himself, establishing new habits. But at present, before he starts down that corrective path, for at present, the frame of reference of others, feed me what others think, is a psychoepistemological program for dealing with issues which means it is at present how his brain is wired up. Now a second-hander is not per se insane. He is not totally incapable of grasping a fact of reality as being independent of what others think. Which means his conscious mind, his conscious mind is not to be equated with his automatized methodology. He retains the ability to grasp the difference between it is and they say. Though this distinction may not have much emotional reality for him at first. But using his conscious mind to hold firmly to this distinction is precisely what he has to do over a long period of time to retrain himself and get rid of his automatized habitual secondhand frame of reference. Well, now that means he can over time rewire his brain. In my previous lecture on psychoepistemology, I ventured to suggest that the subconscious as such is the brain. I said, quote, any subconscious content, while it is below decks, while it is subconscious, prior to being brought into conscious awareness, is a brain state or brain activity. In the intervening two years since I said that, I have become more convinced of the truth of this idea. I think the subconscious is the brain's ability to do several things. Chiefly, to in physically encode memories, like the memory that seven times two is 14. That's actually a physical something in your brain somewhere. So it physically encodes memory and then it reads them. It decodes them and supplies them back as mental contents to the conscious mind. So one part of the subconscious is like your hard disk on your computer. There's more to it than that, but that's a big part of what the subconscious is. Now let me distinguish this from philosophical materialism. The doctrine that consciousness does not exist, that all there is, is the brain and neurological activities. Because if I'm saying something in your psychology is your brain, I want to be very clear that something else isn't. In fact, some of you will probably have heard a catchphrase floating around in that non-field called artificial intelligence. A catchphrase that's fashionable among the denizens of that non-field who are virtually always materialists. The saying is, the brain is the hardware and the mind is the software. How many have heard that? Okay, so it's about 10% of you. The brain is the hardware and the mind is the software. I want to very sharply distinguish my view from that nonsense. The brain is the hardware, but it is not the mind that is the software. It is the automatized psychoepistemological programming that is the software. The mind is the mind. It is your consciousness, the state of awareness, and the faculty that produces that state. Conscious awareness is an irreducible primary. It is not analyzable as software or as anything else. Consciousness is an axiomatic concept, and as such, what it names is an irreducible primary. Okay, that's what I'm not saying. Your mind is not the brain. 
but your memories are encoded in your brain and the automatized habits that you have, your psychoepistemological programming, is encoded into the structure and circuitry of the brain. So the brain is the hardware and the organization of the brain's circuitry is the programming. Think for a minute about Ayn Rand's subconscious, including its automatized circuitry, their psychoepistemology. Now imagine that that subconscious could magically be installed in your brain. Talk about software upgrades. <laughs> Suddenly, you'd be able easily to come up with the right answer to many, many questions. A person of average intelligence with Ayn Rand's subconscious installed in his brain would appear to be a genius. Yes, he'd still have to struggle to gain new knowledge, but the struggle would be, in effect, to reach the top of Mount Everest when starting from base camp at 24,000 feet. With the transplanted subconscious, he would not be struggling, as most people are, to get to the top of a molehill. Now we can return to the opening question. What is applied psychoepistemology? And answer it with more precision on the basis of the distinction between the programming, the hardware, and the conscious mind. What is applied psychoepistemology? Second cut. Take two. Any applied science is defined how? By its goal, by what it's applied to do. For example, the goal of medicine is health. The goal of civil engineering is construction. What, then, is the goal of applied psychoepistemology? I, actually, I answered this before in my first cut, but now we can answer it more clearly. The goal of applied psychoepistemology is to instruct you in the creation and proper operation of the programs that control your subconscious computer. Not to prescribe the tasks that you are to perform with those programs but to tell you how to create and use the software as such to accomplish whatever tasks you are undertaking. For example, the equivalent in the real computer world to applied psychoepistemology would be a course on how to use Microsoft Word. Now learning how to use Microsoft Word doesn't tell you what content you're going to use Word to write. It doesn't tell you, now begin your letters, dear sir. I guess we can't do that anymore due to political correctness, dear person. <laughs> it doesn't tell you, uh, make sure there are no contradictions in any letter that you write out. It simply says, well, if you want to delete a word from a previous paragraph, move your cursor up there by hitting the up arrow key and then hit the whatever. Uh, with your mouse and then hit the delete key and so forth. In the same way, applied psychoepistemology tells you how to automatize a premise, but not what premises to automatize. Now on this basis, let's ask what is the difference between psychoepistemology, applied psychoepistemology, and epistemology. Because epistemology also tells you how to use your mind. But there's a difference in the respect and what aspect is being considered. Here's an example. I think this is instructive. Epistemology tells you, for instance, in any process of cognition, keep the axioms in mind. Applied psychoepistemology tells you how to keep the axioms in mind how to program your brain to help you do that. Now, what is the distinction there? Well, if I said you keep the axioms in mind, are you going to say, OK, A is A, A is A, A is A, A is A, A is A. Now, you want to think, man is mortal, but wait, A is A, A is A. Socrates is A is A. That is not the way you keep the axioms in mind. You don't keep constantly repeating them to yourself. 
To keep the axioms in mind involves the subconscious. The subconscious has to be at the ready, prepared to raise the issue of axioms when and as needed. Psychoepistemologically, keeping the axioms in mind means giving what Ayn Rand called a standing order to your subconscious to be prepared to check for contradictions and to signal you whenever something doesn't fit. And you get that feeling, can't integrate, something doesn't fit. That signal comes from your subconscious. But it only comes from your subconscious unless it's very glaring, if you've programmed yourself with a standing order to keep the axioms in mind. So epistemology tells you what to do to gain knowledge, and applied psychoepistemology tells you how to accomplish that task with your mental software. Applied psychoepistemology tells you how to have a division of labor between the subconscious and the conscious. This division of labor allows your conscious mind to be free to work on the new. You delegate repetitive tasks to your subconscious so that your conscious mind has the room to deal with the new. It's almost like, but not really, it's your subconscious mind that's saying to itself, A is A, A is A, A is A. It's not, it doesn't really work that way, but at least you don't have to do that in your conscious mind. And perhaps one more example will nail down the difference between applied psychoepistemology and cognitive disciplines of other types. Take a young child learning arithmetic. Arithmetic tells the child what two plus two is. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. So two and two is four. Applied psychoepistemology tells him that once he has understood this connection, he can store it, he can automatize it. And the simple way of doing this is to repeat it over and over again. Two and two is four. Two and two is four. It also tells him that he will need fewer repetitions if he bears in mind that automatizing the answer is important. It's something he will need to know and use throughout his life. Now you might think this psychoepistemological advice focus on the importance of what you're trying to automatize and repeat it. You might think that's too elementary to need stating. And it should be. But unfortunately, given progressive education, it's not too elementary and there's actually a crusade against automatizing things like the multiplication tables in education. There has been an opposition to it for some years. There was an op-ed in the New York Times just yesterday reporting on the new math, or the new new math, they call it, whole math, which it consists precisely in attack upon automatizing the basic relationships of arithmetic. You're no longer supposed to automatize 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's enough to understand it once in your conscious mind. This is a terrible, terrible error, or worse than an error. Now apply, that, that illustrates the difference between, say, arithmetic, which tells you the answers to things, and applied psychoepistemology, which tells you how to get your subconscious to take over as much of the process of getting the answers to things as is possible. Now there are several other areas or issues in applied psychoepistemology. Uh, I want to delimit what I'm going to be discussing in these two lectures. So I'm not going to discuss two interesting subfields of applied psychoepistemology, but you should know them so that you have more understanding of what this field is. I'm not going to discuss what I call clinical psychoepistemology. That is how to correct wrong automatizations in order to solve psychological problems. So I'm not going to tell you how to get a second-hander to become a first-hander. I'm not going to discuss what you could call motor psychoepistemology. Motor psychoepistemology. How best to use your mind in the formation of physical motor skills, such as how to use your mental software to improve your tennis game. 
As I said, these are both important subfields or issues, and I'm not in any way slighting them. I think they're both fascinating. But I'm going to discuss only a few psychoepistemological techniques for two subject areas, gaining knowledge and dealing with emotions. And under gaining knowledge, I include applying and integrating existing knowledge, applying it to new concretes, or making new connections. So cognition and emotion are the two fields. And most of what I'm going to have to say in terms of practical tips is going to be in Thursday's lecture. Because this is a new science, or not even yet a science, I have to do a lot of meta applied psychoepistemology or the theory of applied psychoepistemology. So we have to go through all these uh, preliminary ground clearing operations, but I promise you there will be a lot of, well, I don't know a lot, but there'll be at least two or three very interesting techniques, things to do with your mind to uh, make your life simpler, make your thinking more efficacious. Okay, aids to cognition. The question of applied psychoepistemology here is how does one get a good psychoepistemology? How does one get the kind of psychoepistemology that will make learning easier and make one's thinking more productive, more creative, more original? And there are two issues here, two really inseparable issues, but I'll discuss them separately. One, how does one file information in the subconscious? Two, how does one ensure that one can retrieve the information that one has filed? One, how do you file information in your subconscious? Well, that's really simple. By observing, conceptualizing, and thinking. But let's break that down a little. You know that Ayn Rand likened concepts to file folders. When you form a concept, take our old standby, the concept table. You form that in early childhood, and when you did, your subconscious automatically started a file, an open-ended repository of information for facts about tables. All the child has to do consciously on the conscious level, to get that file started, to open a file or create the file, is to observe tables and differentiate them from, say, chairs, to form the concept table. Of course, the word is crucially important here, but I'm not going over uh, the material from epistemology. If he is really forming a concept rather than merely noting some similarities in his immediate perceptual field for the moment, if he's really forming a concept, then he has to make it an open-ended classification. What does that mean psychoepistemologically? It means he gives himself wordlessly the standing order to include under the heading table everything he will ever learn about tables. He has to intend to use that integration permanently. And of course, children do, because tables are all over the place. It hits them over the head that this is a recurrent feature of life. So they naturally, after applying the word table a few times, perhaps with the aid of their parents, they're naturally going to realize, hey, this comes up a lot. I've got to keep this going. Now suppose our child, by continuing to conceptualize as he develops, forms the higher concept, furniture. This is another file in his subconscious. And now he realizes that beds which he has previously conceptualized, are furniture. This is a thought. Beds are furniture. It is a proposition. The general form of a proposition is an identification. S is P. For example, beds, S, are furniture, P. By consciously connecting the two terms, by doing that in his conscious mind, the child also automatically forms a subconscious link between his file on beds and his file on furniture. In physical files in your desk, 
you actually can place one file inside another. I don't think you can do that with your brain. You know, you can take these large files in your desk and put small file folders in the, what do they call them, pendaflex files. But you can't do that in your brain. I think what you do is you establish a link, a pointer, a cross-reference, so that in the file beds it says C under furniture, and in the file for furniture it says, for example, beds. Now, I have no way of you know, knowing what's actually going on, but that's what makes a kind of rough sense to me. So the answer to the first question, how does one file information in the subconscious, is simple. Make conscious mental connections. Your subconscious will make the corresponding link or connection between your mental files. So there's no mystery here about how to form files and how to interrelate them in your subconscious. Well, in a way, there's a big mystery, but the mystery is physiological. But from the standpoint of the conscious mind, all you do is go out and get knowledge. Subconscious is very obedient. There's no separate mental act required to file things you learn beyond simply intending to remember it, remember them. Your subconscious will obediently store the identifications by forming links in the brain between the relevant files, that is, between the concepts involved. That then brings us to the second issue involved in a good psychoepistemology. How do you ensure that you can retrieve the information after you've filed it? And unlike the first point, there's a lot of very interesting, rich, new material under this setting. How do you ensure that you can retrieve the information after you have filed it? Here we come to a very significant fact. If the filing is the linking between items, not all subconscious links are equal. Some links are very strong, others are very weak, others are in between in strength. In other words, some facts are easier to retrieve than others. Now there's no direct corollary to a physical computer. It's not the case that some files are easier to retrieve than others, or some words come to the screen better than others. But some things that are stored in your subconscious somewhere are easily retrievable, and others are very, very hard to get at. Sometimes you make consciously a casual observation or semi-observation, and then it's lost. It doesn't become part of your subconscious equipment permanently, and it won't work for you. You can't locate that file, and or you can't follow its link to other files, links to other files. So how do you ensure that the identificational links aren't lost? How do you ensure that the filing is done in a way that you can retrieve it? Now, of course, there are things you don't care to store, such as a phone number you're going to dial only once in your life, or the color of the shirt of the guy sitting in the third row. It's not that you have to keep on hand and keep active uh, and at the ready, random facts like that. But how do you create strong links to the information you do want to retain? Whether it's concretes worth knowing or abstract identifications. How do you make sure you can retrieve the information you do have and you want to get at? How can you make relevant things come to mind? It's no good knowing things if you can't recall them and bring them to mind when you need them. Now, there are two factors I can think of that affect the ease of retrieval. Values and number of links. Ease of retrieval of an item is the product of the number of links you have to it times the value strength of each link. Now, where do I get that from? Introspection. I think you can verify this in your own experience. I'm going to give you some, kind, uh, some examples that will verify it for you. First, take the values issue. Values are the motor of the subconscious. Values and the emotions they produce are what supplies the motive force, the energy for the operation of the subconscious. 
Roughly what we're talking about here, after all, is memory. Other things equal, you remember what impresses you, what you care about, what you value. Now values are that which you act again and or keep. So I include here under values how often you act again and keep a certain item of knowledge. The more you use it, an item of knowledge, in the service of your values, the more you will remember it. Use it or lose it. It's really true. But also the sheer emotional impact of something is per se an aid to memory and hence an aid to being able to retrieve things. Here's a great story from the history of law. It was told to me by a law student whom I trust, uh, but I give it to you as a story that has psychological validity whether or not it's true, but supposedly it's true. In the Middle Ages, when few people could read or write, there was a problem of how to record the transfer of, the, uh, of land, of real property, between one person and another. When there was no one to write down a deed, how did they record the sale of a piece of land? Well, they did it through a ceremony called fefment, F-E-O-F-F-M-E-N-T, one of those nice old medieval words probably from French. They did it through a fefment. The best they could do was to engrave the sale in the memory of a witness. But there were two requirements for the witness. It had to be remembered and witnessed by, witness and remembered by someone who was young enough to live a long time. And they had to make sure he didn't forget what he witnessed. So when land was to be transferred, they brought along a young boy, told him what was happening, that the land was being transferred from Smith to Jones. Then they took a stick and beat him within an inch of his life. <laughs> that way the experience was something he'd never forget. Now, I'm not quite recommending you beat yourself up to remember, say, the case for capitalism. But to remember anything, you do have to care about it. And here we come to a point from the other branch of psychology, motivation, a point that interacts with psychoepistemology. Your motivational premises certainly affect the strength of the links your subconscious forms, and hence your future ease of retrieval. I think the fundamental here is one's motivational metaphysics. Do you look upon the world as a place worth knowing? Do you intend to live in reality? Or are you more or less disconnected, living inside your head, making only occasional forays into the real world? It comes down to whether you accept that existence exists, whether you make the choice to embrace existence, or not. To the extent you do choose to embrace existence, other, thing, other things equal, you will value knowledge. You will want to know, to know everything. You will be curious and intellectually active. You'll have the same attitude towards knowledge about the world that a lover has to knowledge of his beloved. He doesn't have to say to himself, I uh, better remember that she's got beautiful, long, flowing tresses, because that might come up sometime. And <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, the, the facts about his beloved are like a magnet drawing him to that. Well, the person who's in love with life has the same attitude about any information in the world that bears upon his life. But to the extent you've retreated from existence into an inner life of fantasy or stuporous drift, knowledge of reality will be at best only of conditional value. You will retain only those things that you can use to support your fantasies or your pseudo self-esteem. Now I'm not talking about evasion here, but about whether there is or isn't a positive love of learning. And I'm not talking about school learning, which one could very understandably be uninterested in today. 
but learning about life and what it has to offer you. The knower is the one who has the attitude that the whole universe is raw material for his values. Now Ayn Rand was preeminently a great knower. She was always on the lookout for things worth knowing. And she had a very wide conception of what was worth knowing. She was not a narrow specialist. In many, many fields she knew at least the essentials and at least several telling concretes. And usually she knew much more than that. In her autobiographical interview, she spoke about this premise as it formed in her childhood. And this is the premise you need if you are to file things with oomph so that when something is relevant to them, your subconscious hands that information to you so you can use it. My whole development, I'm quoting now from Ayn Rand, my whole development was based on the idea of looking for things that are interesting. My first concern was to be left alone so I could do what I wanted. What did I want to do? To understand anything which interested me. To understand, that was the main thing. From my earliest years, from preschool, I would ask myself a series of whys. I was very much what my husband once described as the pro-effort child. I wanted to see everything. Life in general interested me." Close quote. So to have a good psychoepistemology means to have one's knowledge available to work for one. Part of that is adopting and enforcing on oneself the commitment to life the commitment to living in reality. That's a point for motivational psychology and ethics, really. There's one specifically psychoepistemological thing you can do in order to strengthen the links among your items of knowledge and hence to improve your retrieval powers. It's an aspect of being in focus. And that's to fixate upon what you learn to stabilize it. When you make an observation, when a thought occurs to you that think has any significance, when you hear the name of a composer that might be of value to you, pause on it, stabilize it in your mind, put it in a little frame. I have come to this conclusion from college teaching. I notice that many of my students just let their minds slide over things. I would tell them, for instance, that a definition has a genus and a differentia. And I would write on the board, G-E-N-U-S and D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T-I-A. And then when I asked them on a quiz, what are the two parts of a definition? They would say the genius and the differential. <laughs> and I realized that uh, it's an issue of, here's a new word, genus, pause, look at it differentiate it from other things that you might confuse it with. What is this thing in front of me? So I had concluded that my students generally, the bad ones, focused in a kind of, uh, took in things as a kind of mental stew. And I've in past lectures asked the audience to do the following experiment. So let me ask you to do it now. Take your eyes and without fixating on anything, just go like this over a 360 degree. Now, you didn't get anything out of that. What shape are the lights on the ceiling? Well, you certainly wouldn't get it from that. And you wouldn't get that genus is one thing and genius is another, and a differential is in your car, but a differential is in a definition, unless you stop and look at the thing. Now, I had noticed this, and I was surprised and pleased to find Ayn Rand making the same observation when I read the following sentence in her philosophic journals. You know that David Harriman has converted uh, her philosophical notebooks and other miscellaneous intellectual writings into one tremendous collection, and that's coming out in about a week, two weeks. As my wife would say, highly recommended. Well, almost at the very, very end, it's on page 800 and something, is one sentence that struck me. Here it is. 
An out of focus state may be a state of rushing past everything, psychoepistemologically, while focus requires slowness. Now I have to say that she placed a question mark in parentheses after this observation. And she said this needs more thought, but I think it's correct. For your subconscious to take a mental identification seriously, you have to pause on it, fixate it, look at it. You can't brush by it. It's like you take a little snapshot of it and then the snapshot can be stored. Now of course it also helps if you give yourself the standing order to use it and then do use it, especially in existential action. The more you use it, the stronger that each link is, but that more comes under values. So the general conclusion is the stronger the links and the more numerous, the more ease of retrieval. What's the easiest possible retrieval there is? What's the jackpot of things that have links so strong there couldn't be any easier access to this material? Automatization. The strongest links are those that are automatized. It's one thing to be able to recall something and quite another to have it automatized. What's the difference between automatizing and just remembering? Automatized means activated without will. The difference between recall and automatization is that what you can merely recall is what you can retrieve by a conscious effort. But what you've automatized comes to mind effortlessly on its own. You don't have to ask for it, it's just there without having to be willed. For example, seven times two is 14. You don't have to ask, oh yeah, seven times two, what, wasn't that one of those even numbers? You just start the sequence. Seven times two is, and 14 pops into mind. It can't be any easier retrieval than that. Now heretofore, I've been talking about retrieval. Up to now, I should say, I've been talking about retrieval in terms of bringing an item that you know into conscious awareness. But there's another kind of retrieval that is equally important, about which, uh, without which you could not function beyond a child's level of awareness. I'm referring to bringing data not into conscious awareness, but into a state of readiness for conscious awareness. I call this activating a category of knowledge by putting it into working memory. In terms of the computer analogy, this is like taking something off your hard disk and putting it into RAM. Now this is, is a uh, big subject that I'm only going to have time to get into for about five minutes. I'm going to take now to make a beachhead in a subject and this is where we'll pick up next time. It's not just specific facts, not just single identifications that can be automatized. A whole raft of information, a context can be automatized. In that case, this whole raft of automatized information does not pop into conscious mind. There's no room for it there, but it's activated and put into working memory. For example, I imagine that most of you can recall the dates of the Civil War, 1861 to 1865. But fewer of you have the dates as an automatized context so that when the Civil War is mentioned, the dates are there in the background or in the periphery automatically as part of your mental set the moment you turn to the Civil War. The reason I give this example is that I grew up in the capital of the Confederacy and the Civil War was one big thing there, let me tell you. And the 100th anniversary of it was during my high school years. Our high school yearbook celebrated the 100th anniversary of what we called the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> and whenever someone says Civil War, 1861 to 1865 is right in the periphery of my mind. And I was surprised that not everyone has this as an automatized context 
uh, that comes into working memory as soon as anything relating to the Civil War arises. But the more information that is automatized, the less work your conscious mind has to do and the more space it has to consider further information and thereby hangs the tail. To explain the tail, I have to present, forgive me for those of you who hate computers, I have to present another computer analogy, this time to the internet. To retrieve information by asking yourself a question is like doing a search of the web on the internet. You search the web by using a search engine like AltaVista. You go to AltaVista and type in a word to search for, say, capitalism. Then AltaVista consults its index of the entire web all around the world and puts on your screen a list of every website that contains the word capitalism. Or it says, I have this and can give this to you. Now imagine you, not the web, you ask yourself, what is every fact I know that pertains to capitalism? Where would you put the resulting mass of information? Your conscious mind can only hold at most seven or eight units. Even Alta Vista limits you to a certain number of hits, I think 200, unless you pay for more. When you have an enormous amount of information on a given topic, the best your brain can do is to activate that context. You put all that information, say all your knowledge of capitalism, or as much as will fit, into working memory, into RAM. You are not consciously aware of that enormous set of data, but it is put at the ready so that your subconscious can feed you what's relevant when and as you need it. This is one of the marvelous powers of the subconscious. It can activate much more relevant data than you could hold in focal awareness. I remind you of a statement by Ayn Rand in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Quote, all learning involves a process of automatizing, i.e. of first acquiring knowledge by full conscious focused attention and observation, then of establishing mental connections which make that knowledge automatic, parenthesis, instantly available as a context, parenthesis, her parenthesis, not mine, thus freeing man's mind to pursue further more complex knowledge. Close quote. In this way, the subconscious enables man to transcend the limits of the crow. That is, the fact that one can only hold in one frame of awareness only at seven or so units at one time. In the workshops on epistemology that is reproduced in the appendix to ITOE in the second edition, one professor asks how we are able to understand long sentences, sentences that have many more than seven words, like the sentence I just uttered. A crazy question, but there's an interesting nugget of information in the answer. Ayn Rand replied in part, the answer to how we are able to understand a whole sentence, let alone a whole book, lies in the nature of concepts. Which part of their nature? Automatization. When a concept automatically stands in your mind for a certain kind of concrete, when you don't have to take the time to remind yourself what you mean by the word table, by the word, word child, etc., it's that speed of lightning-like integration of the reference of your concepts to your words that permits you to understand a sentence. Close quote. So the ability to activate a wide context of information, to have it automatized so that it comes in as a set and can be put in working memory is crucial to overcoming the crow. But interestingly, it seems to me, this is my new hypothesis now, it seems to me that there's still a limitation imposed by the identity of man's consciousness here. There's another bird in there. There's another kind of crow. And we have to cope with it. I've concluded that the subconscious has its own kind of crow. Or let's call it a raven. 
Your subconscious cannot activate and put into working memory every fact you have in your brain at once. You have only a limited amount of retrieval energy. You have only a limited amount of space in working memory. You can't activate at one time your brain's whole store of knowledge. That's the subconscious's crow or the raven. Now here's the significance of the raven. Since you can activate at one time only a limited amount of information, though an incomparably vaster amount of information than you can put in conscious or focal awareness, since there's only a limited amount you can activate, it matters crucially how your mental files are organized. To see this point, let me pose this question. Since all knowledge is interconnected, since every truth is related ultimately to everything else, why do we have to bother with fundamentals? Why doesn't pulling up any fact on any subject automatically activate equally well the whole of our knowledge? I think the answer is the raven. The answer is that there are too many considerations, too many links, too many nodes in the network of your knowledge to fit into limited working memory at once, given the identity of human subconsciousness, if you want. Suppose you're thinking about man. You want to know why man needs objective law. Now you know millions of things about man. Facts about his anatomy, his artworks, his customs, his nutritional needs, his demographics, down to the fact that man can darn his socks. But in thinking about why man needs objective law, most of this information is not particularly relevant. But here are some highly relevant facts about man. Man is a rational animal. He produces the means of his survival. To do so, he has to act long range, and the mind cannot function under force. Now, those are the kinds of facts and connections that you need to have at your fingertips, as it were. That's the context that needs to be right in the top of working memory. Only from those kind of facts can you induce, from appropriate examples of human interaction, the cause of man's need of objective law. If instead of those kinds of fundamentals, your subconscious puts into working memory random facts about man, such as that he darns his socks, he paints portraits, he throws himself under the wheels of trains or can do that. If, though, if that's what's in your uh, working memory, when you turn your mind to the topic of objective law, you'll get nowhere. The relevant facts which maybe you do know, will not be easily available to you. As long as you are in that state, with working memory filled with trivia and irrele irrelevancies, you will be baffled by the idea that man needs objective law. So the limits of the raven impose on us a psychoepistemological need to organize our knowledge in such a way that the relevant facts will be in the forefront at the top of the list when you think. In addition to the limits of the crow, there are the limits of the raven. In addition to the limits of what we can hold in focal awareness, there's a limit to what we can hold in working memory. Not only is it impossible due to the crow to put the entire contents of our brain into focal awareness, it's also impossible due to the raven to put the entire contents of our brain into working memory so that every single fact we know is simultaneously at the ready to apply to solving a given problem. To make our knowledge work for us, given the limits of working memory, we have to file things in the most condensed economical and fertile form possible. In other words, because of the crow and because of the raven, we have to file by essentials. The principle of unit economy applies not only to the conscious mind, 
but also even to the information you put into working memory, the information that's still not yet in focal awareness. And a further exploration of that point we will do on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, take questions. Yes. Yeah, the issue of um, the analogy uh, to a computer confuses me sometimes, coming from the field of AI. I was wondering um, what exactly it is that prevents a computer from doing the work of concept formation. Is it the inability to focus on similarities? Um, and if, if that's the case, it, that only applies to induction. Can computers do deductive work were the information to be stored in hardware. Could you all hear that? I guess the microphone does enable everyone to hear that. I'm glad you asked that uh, question because that's a pet topic of mine. The answer is that a computer can't do concept formation because a computer can't add. A computer can't subtract. A computer can't do word processing. A computer can't be conscious. We add by means of a computer, we subtract, we word process. A computer cannot see, smell, touch, taste, it cannot feel pleasure, it cannot feel pain, it cannot remember, it cannot read, it cannot deduce, it cannot induce, it cannot do any of the actions of consciousness because it is just a physical machine it does not have the faculty of consciousness. Now, I don't know why the materialist idea is so widespread among objectivists, but it is. So I don't mean to single you out for attack here, but it's baffling to me why people in objectivism don't get the idea that consciousness is conscious. If you have trouble getting this, slap yourself, give yourself a fefment. <laughs> Consciousness is that irreducible primary raw state of awareness. Huh? Computers do not have that. Computers combine electronic currents. They light up pixels on the screen. They burn with a laser specks of black stuff onto pieces of pressed wood pulp called paper. Computers do not process information. Computers do not have information. They wouldn't know what to do with it if they had it because they don't have knowledge. So your question, and I get this all the time, and when I said, you, you said you're in AI, I called it a non-field and I said it was dominated by materialists and I'm afraid, unfortunately, you're an example. But so are many, many objectivists. Consciousness is conscious. A computer is not conscious. It can perform things that are similar in outward form to what a person does when he's conscious, but a mannequin has the shape of a human being. That doesn't mean it's a human being. So the, the first thing that you would have to do before a computer could form concepts is to make it able to perceive, and before it could do that it would have to be able to have sensations, and before it could do that it would have to be alive. Consciousness is a faculty of a living organism it's inherently inextricably tied up with the demands of survival. It is an instrument of survival. It is not a ghost in a machine, and it's not nothing. It is a survival function. It, it, pleasure and pain are absolutely essential to it, and that's why values are its motor. The whole purpose of consciousness, I had to cut an aspect of this out of the material. The whole purpose of consciousness is to guide your action. In a way, it's not even cognition. I mean, that's real heresy to say the purpose of consciousness is not cognition. But it's not cognition as an end in itself. The purpose of every level of consciousness is so that you will stay alive because you'll be able to distinguish food from poison, you'll be able to see the oncoming truck or the saber-toothed tiger and get out of the way. 
Consciousness is a means of survival. So before you could even talk about, well, can computers recognize patterns, which is ridiculous, it would first have to be a living organism. Then we could talk. So after you build the living you know, cell, then let's talk about can you build in consciousness to it. Yes? Um, I'd like to ask about the word context. Uh, a concept is one very specific way of organizing information. But you use the word context, it sounds like a related kind of phenomenon, but perhaps somehow flatter on the inside. Uh, a context is just a, a very wide term to indicate a set of interrelated facts. Uh, Dr. Peikoff defines it in OPAR, and an interesting uh, phenomenon of psychoepistemology is that even though I can usually retrieve that definition, because I'm now in a diff I've got my RAM filled with this, I don't have the definition of context in, in working memory. But it's a set of interrelated. Do you remember it? Go ahead. I think it's a set of <laughs> some earlier cognitions conditioning a given item of knowledge. Right. Uh, some of items of cognition. <laughs> this, this is what happens when you ring yourself out for a lecture. I can't even repeat something. You know, that the issue of context dropping, where you take somebody's sentence out of context, yeah. and you have no idea how to interpret it, and you can get anybody to say anything. When you bring in the context, what you're doing is bringing in all the surrounding material that conditions this particular item, that gives you the means of interpreting it. Right. And a context in general is not just for a quote, but for any item of information. It's the surrounding cognitive material that enables you to properly interpret or understand a given item, that conditions that item. Uh, did you get that? Could you hear that? It's a surrounding body of information that conditions the understanding application of a given item of knowledge. So, for instance, in a quote, you know, you go to the uh, movie marquee and it, it says, stunning New York Post. But what actually was said is it's stunning that they wasted so much money making this piece of trash. So it's out of context. The surrounding words in this case condition the meaning of stunning, and to take it out of context means to deprive it of what the actual intent was. Well, the same thing applies, Dr. Peikoff reminds us, of any idea that it, its meaning and application depends upon the surrounding information, including the facts, earlier facts of reality from which you derived it hierarchically. And that's part of the meaning, that's part of the set of information you have to bring to bear on, a, on an issue. Now a concept is a single word that stands for all the concretes of a certain kind, such as the word table stands for all the tables. It's a mental integration, it's a single mental entity. A, a, um, a context is a network of information that conditions the meaning and use of a given concept, or a given sentence, or a given paragraph. So the word context doesn't imply any particular kind of organization of information as such? No, not so really. Everything relevant. Everything relevant, yeah. Thanks. Now, I, I think it's helpful also here, if, if I can um, step into epistemology for a second, to say that the full context of your knowledge means everything you know is one integrated whole. So context is a kind of relative term. Would you agree with this? That you can talk about the context of an item of knowledge, which means the things that immediately surround it and condition it immediately, but they in turn are, have their own surrounds and their own context, the things that condition them. So if you were to talk about the full context of your knowledge, it would mean everything you know. And it, everything you know from the aspect of being integrated into one systematic whole and therefore serving as the frame of reference for the meaning of any one item in it. But I wasn't talking about full context generally, I was talking about the context of a particular piece, what's directly relevant to it. The concept is, is, is an element in that. 
It's like a node in the net. It's the network or a node in the network if you want to use that language. Okay. Um, I like the analogy to the uh, World Wide Web, but I had a question about it. In the World Wide Web, well, on AltaVista specifically, we're looking up words mm -hmm. rather than concepts. I mean, to the extent that there's uh, a distinction. Mm -hmm. and whereas when we activate our subconscious, it, it seems to me we're actually looking for concepts. Is that uh, a reasonable distinction? Yes and no. I, I can't give you a definitive answer, but I'm going to give you an opinionated one. Uh, after you have formed your concept, the, the, the means of the integration and retaining it is the word. From that moment on, once you grasp, say, that table refers to this kind of thing, you've properly formed that concept. The word and the concept are inseparable, particularly if we're talking about the dynamics of the interaction with the conscious and the subconscious. The, the concept is the intellectual content of uh, <laughs> the concept, and the word is how you hold it. So the word is what's much more tied to the psychoepistemological dynamics. Or the word is what your subconscious uses. The concept is more the same phenomenon looked at from the standpoint of its intellectual content. So I think the brain works with words. Now I say I, I really don't, I had not considered that question until this moment, but I think the brain works with the symbols with the words as such, and the intellectual content, if you're going to make that distinction, which is somewhat artificial once you fuse the two, but if you can make that distinction, the intellectual content, the concept, is the epistemological meaning of that, not the neural dynamics of it. So your brain works with words. I did have something, actually, I said I hadn't thought about it, but I did have something in the uh, talk that I also caught, cut out. I must have cut out three talks out of this talk. Um, if, if I ask you what is J plus H, where you let A stand for 1, B stand for 2, C stand for 3, what is J plus H? Anyone know? It's R. I know because I counted it out, okay? <laughs> but intellectually, conceptually, that's the same as what is uh, 10 plus 8. Now suddenly you know what 10 plus 8 is, it's 18. What's the difference? You've automatized the word. Your brain can deal with 10 plus 8. It deals with those symbols so that it brings, the informa it brings up whatever it is that appears in consciousness as recognition, meaning, concept. So I think that's an example or the fact that you could take you know, Atlas shrugged and look at it in Swahili and not know what it is, uh, that distinguishes what your subconscious can work with, which is the symbols, the, the sensory, uh, uh, sensuous, Ayn Rand always called it, sensuous concrete is what your brain can work with. The meaning of it is the concepts, the intellectual side. So I think the brain, yes, does work with the sensuous, physical symbols. I think of words as information processing devices. See, the difference between me and artificial intelligence people, my wife went to Carnegie Mellon, which is the home of artificial intelligence. Herbert Simon, who you've heard mention, teaches there. And uh, I, now I've forgotten the point I was going to make. What was it? Oh, information processing device. He said, man and computers are the same, they're both information processing devices. That's what Herbert Simon said. Man and computers are both information processing devices. Now, you would probably think you'd want to say, no, man is not an information processing device, he's a conscious being. But my viewpoint was just the opposite. No, computers are not information processing devices. They're just electrical instruments, they're no more information processing devices than typewriters are. 
There are things that man uses to aid man in man's information processing. Information exists only relative to a mind. So that's yet more polemics against materialism. Okay? Yeah. I think he was before me. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. You'll, you'll um, be asked. I have, excuse me? I'll get to the other question. Okay. I have a question related to psychopistemology. I was wondering, have you thought about the issue of idiot savants? What's going on in their psychopistemology that allows them to do such things as, say, Rain Man? In the movie, you know, the 256 toothpicks fell on the floor, and within a second, he knew how many. Is this a skill? Is this something that's different, do you think, in the brain? Uh, well, that's a very, very legitimate question to which I haven't got any answer at all. I've heard of idiot savants. I haven't even seen Rain Man. Uh, but no, I don't have the slightest clue, um, but it would be worth looking at. So see, it wasn't hard to take that question. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, I'd like for you to distinguish between love of knowledge and knowledge for knowledge's sake. And my interest in that distinction is that quite often in my quest for knowledge, I find that I seem to just slip into facts that are facts and nothing else. But later on, I do find that sometimes those facts actually wind up having interesting consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, what I didn't, uh, I don't have to repeat the question. What I didn't quote from Ayn Rand was that she said she was very discriminating about what was worth knowing. I think I read part of that. Um, she, she was like Gail Winant. She talks about how Gail Winant went to the library or had to send his goons into the library and they came out fat, having gone in thin. They were stuffed with stolen books and then he read all these books and he read everything. But what he stored and retained was what he could use. And Ayn Rand was very much like that. That she, um, she, did not, uh, she, she was guided by her values in what was interesting to her and what she stored and retained. But her values were metaphysical. Her values were philosophical. So her values were so wide ranging that for her to be interested in things that uh, bore upon her values meant a very wide range of things reduced to essentials. So she was simultaneously very wide and very selective in her knowledge. Now, I, that's just a beginning to answer the question you asked, which is sometimes you see, one seems to be pursuing knowledge as kind of trivial pursuit, as just it's fun to know things. And then later, that information turns out to be useful. I think that's true, and I think the reason why you have, one has a love of knowledge for its own sake, to the extent that that's valid, is that it's a source of self-esteem. Once you grasp that knowing things makes you efficacious, then there's a pleasure in just knowing more, per se, even though you don't see any application. Now, everything bears on everything else. Knowledge is a systematic whole because reality is a systematic whole. So there will be some relationship of every fact to every other. We're going to explore that uh, in Thursday's lecture. But where it becomes, I think, the bad kind of love of knowledge for its own sake is when one becomes contemptuous of its application. When one adopts the ivory tower uh, attitude I'm interested in knowledge, and to apply that knowledge is to degrade it. If it's knowledge about the real world, or if it's knowledge I have to use, I sulk at that, then there's something wrong in your attitude. But I would never fault anybody for enjoying remembering and storing and filing facts. I do, and I think that's a sign of a good thing. Thank you. Okay. Last question. <clears throat> Um, you, were, you already had a question on context, but uh, I had another thought about it that I wanted to get your opinion on. Um, it was the idea you were mentioning of uh, current working context in your subconscious. For example, when we're reading something, we have a current context in mind of what we're thinking about and how that applies to the raven. 
would it be accurate to say that psychoepistemologically that our current working context, in fact, is that working set in our subconscious that the raven applies to, that that is our, in fact, our current working context? Yes, if, if you've got any. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's true that everyone all the time has a certain mental set going. Uh, but it's particularly when you address some question and you really want to know the answer. Or you've got a purpose like, where are we going for lunch? Uh, that establishes a mental set that activates certain information is put at the ready. And uh, that's what's in working memory. Um, I, I'll ask you to observe during all the courses of these lectures at the conference how there's a time for switching gears. And the lecturers will generally say something like, now, we're going to turn to a quite different topic. We're going to turn to the application of this principle. Something like that. You have to establish the context. When I began this lecture here, I had to establish a motivational context. Why should you be interested in something with a ten-syllable name? The psychopistemologic call has ten syllables. <laughs> Which is kind of ironic because it violates the crow. And that's a principle of psychoepistemology. So uh, you have to, in, in lectures, you have to know where you are because you have to, in some cases, bring a new raft of information into working memory. And it can be very confusing if you don't know where the lecturer is, where he's going, or if he suddenly says, now, speaking of astronomy, you know, Betelgeuse is farther from us than Sirius is, but in light years, the, and you say, what? And there's a terrible mental strain because information is now being called directly off the hard drive rather than being accessed from working RAM. And you've got all this stuff in, uh, about some other topic he was discussing in working RAM, and it suddenly seems to need to be flushed out, but you're not sure. So there is a real analogy to your computer here, and um, I just wish all of you would go and study computer hardware. <laughs> With that encouraging thought, we have to end. <laughs>